Hi, and I'll, I'll tell you the reason, I think the way that all of you can have the most impact is I, I was at a meeting at, in, in Mountain View until five o'clock, and if we could have a really good high-speed rail system as opposed to, uh, as opposed to being on the, on the roads, I, I really think that could have the, the best impact um, on, on, on anybody. Um, I'll just give you a little bit about my background. Um, I came out of, out of law school in 1993, so I'm not quite as old as Hillary. Um, and um, I started um, focusing, I was just a normal corporate lawyer. If you know, how many of you are lawyers? How many of you know a lawyer? Okay, uh, so that, that was the operative question. So if you divide the sort of legal community, you kind of divide them into two segments. So the people who do what you see on TV, which is go to court, and then you have the people like me, and really what I do is I just facilitate the movement of money. Um, and people do it in the debt markets or in the equity markets. But I was raised to do that at a big firm in New York and at MoFo, which is a big firm, and basically facilitating the movement of money. My husband was in tech. He actually had his own startup. I often joke, and I, I'm not sure it's really a joke, that he married me for free legal advice, um, <laughs> also for a green card. But that, that's sort of secondary. Um, his startup went well. Um, and, and he ended up actually giving up the corporate world altogether and became a park steward and actually has spent the last 15 years working in, in the Presidio National Park. We sold all of our belongings and, and lived there um, and, and returning it to its natural state. So I was just a normal corporate partner facilitating the movement of money here. Um, and then the first crash happened in 2001. And for me, I really took a step back. Before that, I had just been working. I, I did jokes, sort of, I made money, he did good. Um, and I really had this, this revelation. He was doing all this work in the park. I started hanging out with, I'm, I'm a former Republican. I am not a Democrat. And, you know, can I admit that in that room? How many of you are former Republicans? Anybody else? Okay, that, that's it. Okay, we have one. I have two. Okay, good. Um, it's, it's, hey, recover, recover. I don't know what I am anymore. It's, it's kind of a travesty. That's why you are here not watching the debate. At any rate, um, at any rate, I will say that you know I, I started hanging out, and, and my husband had these, these groups in the Presidio who were really changing the world. And I think for a lot of people, particularly on environmental sustainability and social issues, you take a red pill, and once you've taken it, like in the matrix, you can't go back. And particularly with me, it's climate change. I honestly believe there are so many issues right now that are present that if you focused on all of them with your startup or with your life, you wouldn't be able to sleep at night. You wouldn't be able to do anything. And so I strongly encourage people to pick one, but they're all very related. And I am one of these people who believe we are headed for a cliff. And I will tell you now, I work with Goldman Sachs. They know we're headed for a cliff. Nobody knows exactly how deep it's going to be. It is climate change. It is population. It is water. It is natural resources. It is, it is social and financial inequality. And we're headed there. All of our economic models in this country are premised on the fact that if, in fact, we are headed for a cliff, we will be able to gradually apply the brakes. We're not going to be, because we're not, we don't have high, even high speed rail, speed rail between Mountain View and San Francisco. <laughs> so there is going to be a lot of change. And at any rate, about 2001, I was lucky enough that we had the crash. I had time to stop and think. And I took the red pill. Um, and then I started, for those of you who know, I started working with a group called BSR, Business for Social Responsibility, and I set up Pacific Community Ventures, which was one of the first impact investors in the Bay Area, a nonprofit with a for-profit fund. And that for-profit fund invested only in low-income areas in the state. It started in the Bay Area and has expanded. Um, and through that, I started thinking, wow, corporations could do good. I did a lot of work um, on nonprofit and, and pro bono work on the nonprofit side. I fundamentally believe that the nonprofit and particularly the foundation model is flawed. Um, it, it is economically and, and for a whole bunch of reasons. And so I started looking at corporate form, at ways, I, because I'm a former Republican, I don't, I don't think we can wait and rely on the government, particularly this government, to make a change. It's really the private sector that needs to and must drive change. So how within our constraints, how within our existing corporations and our capital markets can you drive change? So fast forward, since about 2001, I focused and every year, I'm, I'm very lucky I'm at a firm where 40, 50 percent of my time is spent. The other time, I'm still facilitating the movement of, of capital markets because you know, I have to make money for the firm. But um, almost half of my practice is devoted to, to the impact space, to developing corporate forms, and to working with companies and investors in really, really thinking
thinking about how they can have impact. And I think it's important to focus on the, 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 the financial side for a second, because one of the things I found with a lot of companies, and I think Seth is going to talk about sort of a little bit more of the do's and don'ts of how, how you can build a successful company. I found sort of 2006, 2005, when a lot of companies got into sustainability and clean tech, they had fabulous visions. They really saw how they could change the world. But they didn't have the financial rigor to figure out how they could raise capital, even impact capital, most of which most of, of, of it needs to be repaid and to really scale. And so making sure that you combine the passion for impact and the passion and, and the, the sort of the financial viability of your company. And then what I am so excited and why we agreed to do this is what Ella and Seth and Mike are, are doing is really also again bringing that into the tech community and taking it to the next level. And what I'm hoping all of you in this room can do is let's get out of the Facebook and the Salesforce model, which is still, let's make a whole bunch of money developing the coolest tech thing, and then let's little, give a little bit of money away on the side. That is the traditional Silicon Valley model. What you need to do is, I think, what Seth is talking to you about is embed within your, your corporate structure, within what you are doing, having your end product and service be good, but also how you do it be good as well. So that was, I think I've used up all my time on my introduction. But I, I am now, one of the things I do is I teach and I lecture. One of my goals is that in the next five or 10 minutes, you will have enough data that you don't need to hire a high-priced lawyer. And when you do work with somebody, you can give them some guidance or figure out whether they really know what they're talking about in the impact space. So that is, that is the reason for doing this. Um, I do a whole bunch of shit. Um, OK. Uh, first, I, I'm just going to debunk a couple myths. Um, I know that a lot of people, including B-Labs, who I have a lot of respect for, believe that the corporate form is broken. But I will tell you, from, for, for the last 50 or 20 years, I have been embedding mission within corporate forms such as Etsy and Rev Foods that grow up and scale. And you can, in fact, embed mission within your traditional corporate form. Can I just take a pause? Why, can anybody tell me why, even if you're not a corporate lawyer, which most of you are not, you should care about corporate form? I think you should care about it more than anything else in the world, but I'm a little crazy. Um, um, from a standpoint of uh, um, bringing mission into it, or just the corporate Just, just why, why should, I'm going to go back to the beginning. Why should I be talking to you about, about how to embed, why, why should you care if you're starting up or scaling your business about your corporate form? How, that's true. I'm going to correct her because that what she said about corporations and benefit corporations is not exactly correct. Um, but that is true. I think it's like you guys know, you, you kind of know you're in a building. You know your house. The corporate form and the rules that dictate corporate form are what determine and really predetermine a lot of human behavior. And almost every one of you, why do you set up a corporation in the first place? Why doesn't Jen just go and, and run her business out of her basement? Anybody? Do you, to shield and to shield you as a founder from risk. You want some sort of corporate, you know, form around you so that people can't sue you individually. That's exactly the first reason. And then the type of form you choose is exactly right because almost everybody in this world works for some kind of corporate form. It is the dominant force. And I, I do hang out in some groups which are like, corporations are bad. Let's get rid of them altogether. Very interesting. Um, but they're not going anywhere. And in fact, I would argue they are the most powerful force in the world. Well, if they are the most powerful force in the world, in socio and economically, they can also be the most powerful force for change. We had another comment here in the middle. Did you, did you want to well, share something? I was just saying, simplifying an answer to you, it's a persona. It's, uh, that's all it is. Corporate form is a persona, how you see them, and how you feel it, and how you put them. That's all. Exactly. And, and it can affect how you raise money, how you can scale, and how you can have impact all at the same time. So just number one, what Natalie said about corporations only being beholden to shareholders is not true. So the one thing I want to say, a lot of people, and especially a lot of people who have impact, 
go immediately here to the new corporate forms, the benefit corporation, which is different in every state and different from the public benefit corporation and different from a B Corp, which I'll explain in a minute, is one viable option. Hybrids, where you combine nonprofits and for profits, they're often called tandem, is one option. But traditional corporate forms are also a good option. They have their drawbacks. But in fact, with a corporation, you have what's called the business judgment rule. The business judgment rule says that essentially, for non lawyers, you don't have to maximize shareholder value in the short term. You have protection against liability if you consider social and environmental environmental factors. So why don't companies take advantage of that? Well, some of them do. I was just down at Google. Google's got Google.org. I'll tell you, a whole bunch of the stuff that they're doing at Google.org does not lead directly to shareholder profitability. They do it because they have the business judgment rule. But why don't corporations rely on this more now? There's the shareholder supremacy theory. I would actually argue outside of, cor uh, outside of corporate form, there's quarterly reporting. Everybody's trying to beat the street. There's compensation. Everybody's paid in stock options. And then there's just kind of what we all believe. How's Apple doing today? How's their stock price? You know, it's just, it's easy to measure. It's become almost synonymous with good is in terms of the price. And that drives it. Even though, just so you know, if you set up a corporation, there is a lot of flexibility. Shareholder voting agreements, you can also with a normal corporation, you can take all of the elements from a benefit corporation and agree contractually with your shareholders that you are going to focus on mission. Um, and your charter provisions, you can put protections in your charter, particularly around super voting rights. The super voting rights that all the big boys in the valley have, you can have right here. Um, and instead of having them because you're Mark Zuckerberg, you can have them because you're Jennifer Van Dusen. And Jennifer wants to maintain control, not because she's a power freak, but because she wants to maintain her own impact. So those are just an IP licensing. Actually, this is my favorite, for those of you who've heard me speak before. This is where you take a valuable piece of IP. So all of these, the downside, is that they're permissive. You can renegotiate. Shareholders can force you to do this. The downside is this: all of this goes away in a change of control when you sell the company. There are some downsides. The IP licensing is the most effective. You take a valuable piece of IP. You either leave it with you as a founder or put it in a nonprofit and license it in. And in that agreement, say, this license is broken if you ever violate the mission. It's the, be the most effective form of mission lock. How it's impacted in M&A is a different question. LLCs, just remember, for those of you setting up, not as investor friendly, although that's difficult. That's, sorry, that's different in, the, in our world. LLC or Matev. Matev and I with an LLC, very, OK. If, how many of you have not formed a company yet or are going to form a new company? An LLC, you can go to the Secretary of State website, get one piece of paper, and file it, and you're an LLC. It is that simple. You don't need to go on LegalZoom. You don't need to hire a lawyer. At some point, you need an operating agreement. You can get a little help, and an operating agreement is just like that shareholders agreement that I talked about earlier. In your operating agreement, it is legal for LLCs to be mission first, to have mission in there, to have protections around mission, to have reporting on mission out to your shareholders, all possible with an LLC, and interestingly, with a partnership. One of the creative things we're doing a lot with venture funds, which are structured as partnerships, is actually blending mission in. And that's totally legal and OK. Cooperatives and ESOPs, really cool. Don't have time to go through them. Um, so <laughs> new corporate forms. This is all the flavors of new corporate forms. Not in California, so not as relevant. But this is a variation of an LLC that is mission first. The benefit corporation, the thing to remember about the benefit corporation is that it's in 30 states, but it is very different in state by state. It doesn't work well in all states. Um, and it really has a laundry list of sort of goodness that is baked into the statute. Um, you can see that as a positive. I, I tend to see it as a negative. If you have to be beholden to 25 things, I think it's more difficult to have impact. There are other people who completely dif disagree with me. It's more of a policy decision. Do you, you know, in fact, to be a good corporation, you need to have equal emphasis. Um, these, because they are, because of drafting issues, these are more difficult and less investable. And it's also difficult to get DNO insurance. 
So then you have the PBC and the SBC. These are very similar to the benefit corporation. And in fact, all of these are mixed up and called benefit corporations a lot. All of them are called B Corps. I'll get to B Corp in a second. But here, the difference between these and the benefit corporation, it's much more of a shareholder rights. I'll, I'll go to Julia. So Julia and I will set up a PBC in Delaware. PBC is in Delaware. SBC is in California. We'll agree that we're going to combat climate change. And in fact, our mission is going to be reforestation in Tanzania. I don't know what the hell you're doing, but that's what you're doing now. OK, so you know, we can have one specific purpose. And we agree it. It's in our charter. And with all of these, the big difference between the new forms and the old forms is the old forms are permissive. Rick could choose to invest in all these things. The new forms are all mandatory. You have to. And the very, very exciting thing that's happening with these new forms is if you don't emphasize this mission sufficiently, you can be sued exactly using the same mechanisms that you use with a normal corporation. A shareholder can sue you for breach of fiduciary duty just like they can um, for, for breach of fiduciary duty for losing money if you're a normal corporation. What is really, really excited, and I, I kept these really short so it's not on here, is the, the benefit corporations, because of their structure, can't really scale. The PBC and the SPC can. And in fact, you have two PBCs that have filed to go public as publicly traded companies. And so we are just about to see, for those of you on the, 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 the mainstream capital market section, just how, how the public markets are going to view these. Laureate, uh, a, a, a company that was public, taken private. It's KKR based, backed. It, it filed a year ago. I'm not sure it's going to go out. I'm also not sure it's the best example. Even more exciting, the Danone White Wave merger is going to be a PBC that is publicly traded. And if you don't understand what that means, again, you are taking a company, you are putting it on the New York Stock Exchange, and you are shifting the rules completely, where instead of focusing on shareholder value, although they can do other things, you are saying you, in fact, board and management have to focus on these shareholder agreed goals. And you think about how that could make, wend its way all the way through the organization. Because one of the things I feel find most frustrating, and I can't say the name of companies because I'm being taped, but some of our companies and the CEOs and the boards are like, yeah, we get it. You know, we're, we're there. But then when you're doing deals or you're talking to people at the company, they're miserable. They're being mistreated. They're, I mean, they're, you know, riding the buses at 10 o'clock at night on the wireless back from Mountain View. Again, we need the high speed rail. Okay. So those are the new corporate forms. Do I have two more minutes? Sure, yeah. OK. <laughs> OK. So you guys now know more than most corporate lawyers in America about the new corporate forms. So does everybody feel the power of corporate form? Yeah. Everybody? OK, good. OK, so hybrid forms, this is basically when you marry a nonprofit and a for-profit. If all, if, if, does anybody in this room have revenues more than five million with their company? A couple. You guys should consider it. The rest of you should not. OK? The reason is it's a really good idea. And when I set up the first one, Pacific Community Ventures, in 99, they were the, like the bright, shiny bobble. I was like so friggin' excited about these things. I mean, you could put them together. They could work together. The issue is conceptually that a nonprofit is legally required only to use all of its resources for the mission that is, that, is, that is defined and filed with the IRS and the Attorney General. And there are like 100 pages of rules that were written around the time of the first Rockefeller that say, you then can't use those assets to benefit a for-profit. So when you say that that's, it's a basic private environment for those of you who are a little more sophisticated. And so what that means is when you have a nonprofit and a for-profit that are working closely together, you have to make sure that you carefully track the flow of people, the flow of IP, the flow of funds between the two to make it work well. Or if you grow up and get audited, you're screwed. And so they are a really viable option. I, there was actually a, the fall issue of the Stanford Social Innovation Review, um, the Kepler's bookstore model that we put together and now 21 different independent bookstores are using. We took the arts and lectures and put it in a nonprofit. We took the book selling function in a for-profit, and then we have them working very closely together. It allowed them to offload some of the capital costs to a nonprofit, and it's fabulous. Operationally, it's difficult for them because they have to track, again, employees and funds. They were able to fundraise, and we actually got John Doerr to invest. Um, so we were able to fundraise and take grants and donations from the nonprofit. Even more exciting, Medicines 360 I work with right now, 
uh, women's in the area of women's health, Medicines 360, big nonprofit, out with Liletta, that's actually combating Zika. Um, so they, they came up with this idea, they got grant funding, they have a fabulous device for women's health. It was so good, they're like, big pharma wants to sell it to rich women. So we, we have a structure where the nonprofit has a wholly owned for-profit sub. The for-profit sub sells above market the device to, to women in the public sector. The, the nonprofit sells in the private sector, and the for-profit was able to do a $600 million licensing deal with Allergan to get the product out there. That's how you have just huge impact. That $600 million licensing revenue then goes back up into the nonprofit, and think about now the budget. They're not dependent on grant funding. The budget they have now really to have impact and come up with more devices. So hybrids are fabulous. I love them. Just don't go into them until this one you really do need to talk to somebody who knows knows what they're doing. And on our website, we're trying to get more and more open source material. So if you want to do it, you can, you can do it. Um, and then finally, I just want to say, regardless of the corporate form, I work with a lot of investors. I started working with Omidyar years ago, and they let me be very creative in terms of structuring debt and equity instruments and blending impact in. And so thinking about convertible debt, if you're investing in a company or taking money from investors, you could have affirmative covenants that tell um, Srinath. Hi, Srinath. I can tell Srinath exactly what to do as an investor with his money. I can tell him that he's got to use his money for a positive purpose. I can actually have a provision that says if he doesn't use it for the mission, I'm going to call default. That's dangerous if he has other debt because then there could be a cross default kind of a bad thing. So sometimes we just have you know, a, a, you know, a, a, a mission interest rate. So if you deviate from the mission, maybe there's a higher interest rate. All of that kind of stuff with debt. Preferred equity, we talked about this a little bit, but blending into the preferred equity, and some of these we're seeing, um, some of this we're seeing at, um, um, in the mainstream capital markets as well, in terms of, of blending in. All of these we structure so they look and feel and act just like normal investment terms, so they don't scare VCs off. Um, and then safes, a simple agreement for equity. Uh, we've also put blended mission in there in terms of the affirmative covenants. So that's, I went on a few minutes longer than I think I was supposed to because I get very excited about this. Um, Seth, I think you're next. Yeah, thank you so okay. much. Yeah, I'm, I'm